quite a bit to go over in a short amount of time. Um, so we're going to go on to um, foot pain. So from heel pain to forefoot pain, um, and we'll start off with uh, subcalcaneal heel pain. Uh, any age, it affects anybody young to old, usually more active populations. Um, and people, patients come into the office, it's kind of that uh, you know, universally despised. Patients hate it, we hate it, but, um, but it's very common. So plantar fasciitis is the most common cause. It's generally misunderstood and overly treated. Um, also includes um, other things we'll talk about is uh, nerve compressions, lateral, uh, lateral plantar nerve compression, uh, stress fractures, and uh, fat pad atrophy. Um, so Evan kind of alluded a little bit earlier about the plantar uh, fascia and the anatomy, uh, and it, it really originates off of the, um, the medial calcaneal tuberosity. Um, so when people think about the plantar fascia, and everybody comes in the office and they say, well, do, do I have a heel spur? Um, and so the spur is actually not the medial tuberosity. So they're two different, uh, they're two different things. Uh, plantar fasciitis is really more of the micro tears uh, near the insertion of the plantar fascia, and it's more of a traction periostitis. Um, so again, this goes on to the heel spur. It's, it's always the great, you know, can't wait to see that x-ray. I was told I have spurs and they need to come off. Um, but the heel spurs, they don't cause plantar fasciitis. Uh, they're probably caused by similar uh, repetitive loading mechanisms, more in the flexors to the toes. Um, and so again, we just mentioned that the heel spurs, they're not the attachment for the plantar fascia, it's that medial tubercle uh, of the calcaneus. Um, so just some numbers, one in 10 people have heel spurs. Uh, one in 20 of those with heel spurs have heel pain. So there's a lot of spurs running around out there that aren't painful. Uh, the heel pad, this is sort of an ingenious um, uh, cushioner of the foot. Uh, it's an elastic uh, fibrous tissue that forms a honeycomb pattern around the, the fat in the foot, which makes a, a really gr a good shock absorber. Uh, one of the things that does happen, though, is with age, we have less collagen and water content, um, and so less, elastic less elasticity, and uh, we get fat pad atrophy also, which is a normal part of the aging process. If we can find a way to put it back in, uh, we'll all be sitting out in the, the patio drinking umbrella drinks. Um, so again, for history physical, you know, for the plantar fasciitis, uh, that pain that Evan alluded to, it's more that kind of anterior medially based heel pain. Um, the presentation is it's generally worse in the morning, first getting out of bed, after getting up uh, uh, after any prolonged sitting. Uh, and it does progress as they go on throughout the day and they'll get sore at night. Um, and it can be that bad that they just they won't wear, bear weight on it. Um, as you question more neuritic type pains, you think about impingement, whether it's uh, tarsal tunnel, uh, Baxter's neuropathy, um, also lumbar as well. So Tenel signs, um, like we mentioned earlier about the medial ankle, we think about tarsal tunnel. Um, other things are the uh, calcaneus stress fractures, so part of the history, there's an athlete, uh, they increase their training regimen, increase their mileage running, um, is in a relatively acute onset of pain or was there a gradual progression? Uh, and then the heel squeeze that um, we alluded to earlier, they're all concerning for a, a stress fracture, so treated differently. Uh, as far as imaging, usually x-rays kind of start off with, um, you can see fractures or sometimes stress fractures that are chronic, um, but uh, if you're not sure, bone scan um, is an easy test to order. Um, oftentimes people go right to MRI study, however. Um, this can give you two pieces of information. You can see the thickening of the plantar fascia. Sometimes you can see some little intrasubstance signal changes and, and small tears. Um, and you can also see the marrow edema if it's present for a, a calcaneous stress fracture. Um, in these, it doesn't show the marrow edema, so this is really more in indicative of plantar fasciitis where it's thickened, see some intra-substance signal changes, and on the right, um, the T2-weighted images, there's a little bit of edema down at the insertion where the arrows point. Um, just to talk about the, knee, the nerves nearby, uh, briefly hit on these, but the medial calcaneal branch uh, innervates the heel skin. Uh, there's medial plantar, lateral plantar, and then the first branch of the lateral plantar is uh, the Baxter's nerve, which has a mixed uh, motor and sensory. Um, so the first branch, the Baxter's nerve, can get entrapped between the fascia of the abductor hallucis and the FDB. Um, if we do think it's a nerve issue, um, EMG nerve conduction studies are an important part because it'll detect the, the, um, the tarsal tunnel. Also, you can see the, um, the lateral and medial uh, calcaneal branches uh, that are affected. So this can help to either rule in or rule out this problem. Um, 
other things, again, we start to think higher up, spine etiology, um, also infections, diabetics, they're insensate, they step on things, don't realize it, um, and they usually don't have pain. Sometimes they'll get pain when they have an infection. So for plantar fasciitis, um, the orthopedic treatments that we generally recommend, heel cups are a symptomatic treatment, helps to relieve some of the pressure on the heel. Uh, oftentimes the source of this issue that drives the plantar fascia is it's an overstress of the plantar fascia from a tight gastroc. So with that silver scold test that was mentioned earlier, you can delineate a tight gastroc. Um, and part of what we do to work on that is a night splint like we see on the far left. Um, you can see the, um, the oblique straps on the side. So the key to these, to get patients to actually use it, is to have them adjust those straps. It's not meant to stretch them at night. It's meant to just keep their foot from drooping down into a fully plantar flex position. Because then when they get up first thing in the morning, they're stretching the gastroc and Achilles complex, also the plantar fascia. Um, and then also plantar fascia specific exercises, almost always um, we see it in combination with a gastroc contracture, so specific stretches um, tailored to the gastroc. Um, other things, uh, oftentimes we'll start with a home program, uh, but, off, but when they're refractory, uh, we'll integrate physical therapy as well. Um, depending if it's been a long, uh, if they've been dealing with it for a long time, sometimes therapy will integrate a little bit earlier, but they'll ensure that we get a good technique with stretching because we'll show them in the office, give them a handout, um, but then they go home and they come back in four weeks or six weeks and say it still hurts, but they're doing it wrong. Um, so modalities with antiphoresis or ultrasound. Um, Graston's a really great technique for um, the gastroc contractures, as well as if they have more of a mid-substance uh, plantar fascia. So if their pain is in the plantar fascia, I'll oftentimes refer for that as well. Um, injections, um, people get cortisone injections all the time. Uh, cortisone injections uh, are really a small part of my practice because there's a downside to it. We talked about the heel pad and uh, cortisone will atrophy the normal fat in your feet. So if you start getting multiple injections, you're going to atrophy your normal, your normal cushion and, and heel shock absorber. Um, so there was, uh, there's some studies looking at uh, amnion and placebo. Um, and uh, Foot and Ankle International in 2018, they had a randomized uh, trial where they had significant uh, difference in improved uh, pain and functional scores. Um, again, these are still considered experimental. Um, PRP also had some more, affecting, more effective and lasting benefits uh, versus cortisone, and that was uh, from the study in 2014. Uh, about 90% of patients respond. Sometimes it takes a while. Um, with the stretching programs, generally, um, Integrating all those together, usually I give patients an expectation of about 20% improvement um, over um, the first month of the six weeks, and then gradually improve uh, thereafter. So it's really self-limiting, again, as long as we work on the underlying cause if they do have uh, a tight gastroc. Um, and again, we tailor our treatments to the diagnosis. So if plantar fasciitis, majority non-operative. Uh, if they do have a nerve entrapment, um, Usually we'll treat them uh, non-operatively uh, unless they have a mass occupying lesion in the tarsal tunnel. Um, in about three to six months, if there's no improvement, uh, think about nerve decompression. Um, and then um, stress fractures, we treat like a fracture. We immobilize, take the weight off. Fat pad atrophy, they need more cushioning, those gel cups, uh, sometimes some custom uh, inserts from the, uh, usually I'll do them from the orthotist, but um, like inserts we use for diabetics that are dual layer foam um, that helps to uh, add some cushion where they don't have it. Um, so just, you know, surgical treatments really for plantar fasciitis, um, I haven't released any plantar fascia in five years um, of doing just foot and ankle. Um, the majority of these do respond um, occasionally with a real tight gastroc. I've done a gastroc recession for, um, but for the associated issues, um, tarsal tunnel, this is just a demonstration of tarsal tunnel release, and then um, further distally is where you, uh, you find that the terminal branches and to fully release not just the tunnel, but release the terminal branches is a complete treatment. Um, we'll kind of move towards the, the, the forefoot now. Um, we'll hit on hallux rigidus. It's, this is what people kind of think of. I have this bump on the top of my foot. And so every, every bump is, is called a bunion generally. So this is the dorsal bunion. It's the bunion on the top of your foot. Um, generally, their pain with raising up on their tiptoes, reaching into a cabinet, uh, their stiffness, um, and pain with motion. Oftentimes, it's due to a previous injury. Uh, sometimes it could be due to an underlying uh, Rheumatologic gout um, is pretty common as well, or just general OA. Um, so in, in the office, your physical exam, um, you'll see, um, just kind of going back, they have that bump on the top. 
Um, they'll have limited motion. And if it's uh, unilateral, you can compare it to the other side as well. Usually terminal plantar or terminal dorsiflexion, extending the toe, is when they'll be more symptomatic because they have that, uh, that spur on the top of the metatarsal and, and phalanx. Um, so treatments generally start off with uh, non-surgical treatments, accommodative footwear, um, little, uh, wider, or deeper toe box to accommodate for the bump, um, a softer shoe. Um, also, if it's more with the flexion and mobility for exercise, uh, this is an example of a turf toe plate. So this is a carbon fiber, uh, a little more expensive than a steel one, but um, if they're exercising when in it, 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 it'll last longer and provide the same relief. So the idea is to immobilize the arthritic joint. Uh, and then operative treatments for these early on, if there's uh, mostly the dorsal spur and the joint surface is relatively preserved, we basically just take off the bump on the top. Um, there are some implant options um, with joint replacements. Uh, there are not really good long-term study on joint replacements. There's a synthetic implant that's shown some promise, but uh, there's also been some questions about it as well as its effectiveness. Uh, and then fusion's the other options too. There's some pictures of post-surgical there's other methods we use. Um, these are some older techniques. Um, but patients get back to normal activity. So after you know, a fusion, uh, people have gotten back to running. Uh, the big thing that I counsel patients on for fusions, is, um, especially a female population, if you're wearing heels, nothing more than a two-inch heel. Um, some people don't, won't agree to that, and, and then we have to think about other options. Um, staying in the forefoot, we'll move a little bit more central lateral um, neuromas. Uh, typically, you call it Morton's neuroma or just interdigital neuroma. It's uh, involving the common digital nerve um, that runs beneath the transverse uh, metatarsal ligament between the metatarsals, uh, and then it gives its branches to the, to the respective digits. Um, most commonly in females, unilateral, and the third web space. The symptoms, generally, it's plantar plane. They feel like they're walking on something, a pebble, a stone in their, in their shoe, and they just can't get it out. Um, Sometimes a burning pain radiates into the toes. Uh, something may be moving in the foot, or they, again, they feel like they have something in their shoe. Uh, tight shoes make it worse. Um, so if, um, people trying to cram into a, a skinny tight shoe, pointy shoes, uh, they compress the metatarsals, and they, it kind of mimics that Mulder's test uh, that was mentioned earlier. Um, also, the heels will put more, uh, higher heel will put more pressure on the, the forefoot as well, uh, trapping the nerve. Um, so bare feet, soft-soled shoes usually help better, or sandals that are open-toed. So with the physical exam, they're having that plantar tenderness, and this is a picture kind of depicting, you know, palpating the metatarsal heads themselves um, versus the, the space between them. Um, and it's hard to feel a palpable mass unless they're you're really large. Uh, you won't usually feel a mass. But the Mulder sign is when they get the click and the rep reproducible pain uh, when you're compressing the metatarsals together. And numbness is really a rare finding. Um, so diagnostic studies, x-rays we start off with. Sometimes there's associated pathology or other things that could be causing the problem as well. Um, and this is just metatarsal phalangeal joint instability. Um, and that's one of the, um, the issues with multiple cortisone injections. You can weaken the collateral ligaments. So if you have multiple injections, you can end up with toe deformities that were uh, a result of injections to treat a different problem. Um, Ultrasound MRI, these can confirm the, um, the neuroma. Uh, and injection selective uh, can be helpful. You can do diagnostic with just lidocaine, or um, you can do them non-guided or ultrasound guided would be my preference, because you can really target the nerve and just use a small amount. Um, and again, these are just sort of the different things that can mimic or, or cause some of that forefoot pain, some synovitis. Again, we talked about the fat pad degeneration. It happens in the forefoot as well as the hind foot. Uh, Freiberg's infraction is a... Um, osteonecrosis, typically the second metatarsal head where they get flattening and some early degenerative changes. Uh, again, what we think about neurologic and other tumors that could be an issue as well. Uh, the non-surgical treatments for the neuromas is uh, a wider, soft um, lace shoe with a low heel. Again, avoiding that loading of the, the ball or, or forefoot. Uh, the metatarsal pads, this, the green picture um, is a picture of the metatarsal pad that we typically put in the shoe. So it sticks to the shoe, not the patient's foot. Um, some people will stick these things to their foot, and we just let them know that it goes in the shoe. Um, so again, steroid injections, very selective. Uh, these are things that I'll do once, and if they get relief and it doesn't last, um, you know, we think about other things like surgery or, or just the shoe modification if it does enough for them. But those are the side effects of, um, 
of the steroid injections, the fat atrophy, you do get the skin discoloration that was mentioned in the hand, lecture, hand lectures earlier, um, and then joint capsule and collateral ligament uh, degenerative uh, changes that can result in instability. Um, so for surgical, we excise the neuroma, usually a dorsal incision, we take out the nerve. Plantar, if they get a scar, it causes you know, you get a painful scar, and there's no way to fix a painful scar. Well, you can revise it, but you can have another painful scar. Um, and so surg surgical treatments, about 80% with uh, the first time treatment and non-revision is 80% uh, success. People have uh, complete resolution, 20% um, or 10% have partial and another 10 have um, incomplete relief or no relief. 